Hello. Uh, my name is Karol Sobczak, and this is... Uh, yeah, I'm Michael McCune. I'm a software developer at Red Hat. Uh, and I'm a software developer at Starburst and actually one of the co-founders of the company. I'm also the Presto committer. And today we will talk about Presto uh, and also about Kubernetes and how these two play together. So what is Presto exactly? So Presto is an open source community driven project which was started by Facebook and Facebook open sourced it in 2013. And from, uh, from that time, uh, it, the community grew around the project. There were more committers, more companies involved into the project. Uh, so it's quite large at, the, at this point. Uh, in the essence, Presto is a distributed SQL engine. Uh, there were two goals uh, dri driving the Presto. So first of all was the scalability and the other one was the performance. So because Presto was uh, developed initially at Facebook, those two goals were mm, like the main motive of creating the Presto. So the Presto was tested for those two key aspects uh, every time during, it, dur uh, during it, its lifetime. Uh, okay, so the main feature of Presto is actually that it separates computation from the storage, and this gives you great flexibility. Uh, for one, you can scale compute resources separately from the uh, storage resources. You can have multiple clusters for computations. For the other, uh, the other important reason, uh, factor of this is that because you separate compute, you can also federate data from multiple data sources. So Presto can read data from the data sources, uh, from multiple data sources like HDFS, but also from distributed storage in the cloud, but also from other data sources like um, traditional uh, relational databases. Another thing is that Presto allows you to not log in with any specific cloud vendor or vendor at all. So Presto is Hadoop distro agnostic. It's not tied to any big Hadoop distribution. Because it's, it supports multiple storages, you, also are, you are also not locked in within the storage. So you can read from S3, Google Cloud, Google Storage, Azure, files, Azure, Azure Storage, and so on. So if you want to move from one cloud to another, Presto also is a good choice here because you can have a common interface to your data independently where your data lives. Uh, there is a lot of companies that use Presto. Uh, a lot of them are web scale companies. Uh, obviously, the most famous one is Facebook, but there are also other ones like uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Yahoo, Netflix, and so on. We will get to more details later on uh, when I will describe the scale at which they run Presto. Let's go briefly about, let's describe briefly the Presto architecture. So Presto is essentially, Presto is essentially composed of two components. One is the coordinator and the other uh, one is our workers. So when the user issues a query, he goes, he, he goes to coordinator with the query request. The coordinator then uh, does the query parsing. It optimizes the query. Uh, and it also plans the work and schedules the work on the workers. The workers are the nodes that do the heavy lifting. They read the data from the external data sources. And do, they do the computations like uh, distributed join, uh, aggregations, whatever is needed to run the SQL query. Uh, right, and obviously, again, it's important that it can read from multiple data sources. Uh, yeah, so why Presto is that fast? First of all, it's, it's in-memory processing engine. So no intermediate results are dumped to any persistent storage. And this is one aspect why it's uh, 
so performant. Another important factor is that it's columnar processing. It's based on columnar processing, so internal structures within the Presto itself uh, store the data in a vectorized format. Uh, and uh, we are very, um, we put much, very great focus to details when tuning or writing high performance critical code like operators. So we try to use data structures in such a way that we minimize uh, garbage collections and ideally Presto should never trigger a full GC in Java. We also do a lot of micro benchmarks and macro benchmarks and we, so for example, when we change some aspect of a operator like join, we really try to make sure it's faster, it doesn't break, and actually, uh, right, so we try to assert the quality here. Another thing is that we generate runtime, uh, in, at runtime we generate bytecode for the query execution. So, for example, if you have uh, an expression in SQL on a, or, a, or a projection or something like that, then for such things, we generate bytecode so that we reduce the interpretation overhead. Uh, and very important factor is that we have a dedicated Parquet and RSC readers which read directly to internal Presto structures uh, and because those file formats are also columnar, we get really, really good performance here. Uh, as I mentioned, Presto can read from multiple data sources, and this is implemented via a thing called connector. So connector, uh, there is a, in Pre within Presto, there is a connector SPI, and if you want to implement your own connector, you have to implement certain classes, certain interfaces of that SPI, so for example, you have to implement the metadata SPI to tell the Presto what tables you have, what schemas you have, and what are the table layouts. You also can implement the statistics API. So Presto comes with an advanced cost-based optimizer so that if you provide statistics to the Presto, it can optimize the query better and make the query run faster. Also, another SPI that you have to implement actually is the data location SPI. Oh, uh, yeah, so you, you have to tell the Presto where the data lives. Uh, and workers have to, and you have to also implement the data streaming SPI for, so that Presto actually can read the data from your data source. If you do all these things, then you have your own connector. Um, how you can deploy Presto? So Presto, I think the most common now deployment pattern is that you can deploy Presto uh, separately from the storage, and this is becoming more and more important once we move to the cloud. Uh, this gives a great flexibility of upgrading clusters, having clusters for multiple wo different workloads, or just having cluster per, per internal user group within the company. But historically, it, it, is, it is still possible to deploy Presto, to collocate Presto with the storage nodes. And if you are a larger company like Facebook, they, even, they use even more advanced storage patterns like um, mixed. Uh, so you actually put Presto nodes in the same rack as the data nodes. So this is for the really, really large clusters, on-prem clusters. Um, so what's the ecosystem of Presto? Uh, first of all, the most important connector of Presto is the Apache Hive connector. So be using this connector, uh, you can have a seamless uh, experience when moving from Hive to Presto. Uh, and uh, basically this connector um, tries to behave similarly as what, as what Hive does for the storage. Uh, despite its name, the connector can actually read metadata from not only Hive Metastore, but also from Glue, for example. And <clears throat> it can be used to read data from HDFS, S3, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Blob, ADLS, Gen 1, Gen 2, uh, or S3 compatible systems. Uh, so anything you want. <clears throat> now, it is important to understand that we don't use Hive underneath to execute the query, so uh, 
Presto, it's the Presto engine that's running the queries, not Hive, and that's why we get uh, great, great performance. Uh, apart from the big data connectors, you can also have uh, connectors to your relational databases. So we, to name a few, we support MySQL, PostgreSQL, um, Redshift, SQL Server, and so on. The list is large. So, uh, yeah, and we do things like push down of filters to the relational databases, for example, right? And this will continue to grow. As we move forward, we'll push even more stuff to, to the underlying databases. <clears throat> now, we also support a, vari a bunch of uh, non-relational data sources, like um, Accumulo, Kafka, Elasticsearch, to name a few. So, because of this, you can have a really unified view over all of your data within your company, over various data sources. Uh, <clears throat> so this frees you from having to have your own ETL for some cases. Now, within Presto, we support, uh, we try to be, uh, well, we, actually, we, we are actually ANSI SQL compatible. So the whole TPCH, TPCDS suits pass we don't uh, need any hacks there, they just run. Uh, and we support some advanced SQL features like very complex correlated subqueries or, I don't know, some advanced window functions, to name a few. Now, apart from that, Presto also comes in with the security patterns. <clears throat> so, for example, I think the most notable feature is the user impersonation. So, the user that comes to the Presto will be, the Presto will then impersonate that user when talking to external data sources so that you, uh, one, you, you have, you can pr preserve your security patterns, security enforcements, uh, and the other aspect of that is that you can have uh, auditing, for example. Uh, another important thing is that, and this is actually exclusive to Starburst, we have a Sentry and Ranger support. So what Ranger gives you is that you can do uh, column masking or row filtering, and this is really this really becomes important once we move to this since we are moving to um, more uh, restrictive law again uh, law about uh, how you store the data and who can access the data. <coughs> now, also when logging into Presto, you can use various patterns like Kerberos or LDAP or basic authentication, which is password-based. We, we are constantly adding new things there. Yeah. So how do you actually talk to Presto? So you can use JDBC, open source JDBC driver to within your application, but you can also use CLI. There is also an ODBC driver, which is commercial, and this is, also, this is from Starburst. Uh, and yeah. Mm, so, and you can use various tools to um, use to query Presto. So if you want, if you don't want to go, if you don't want to write your own query, pipe, query um, pipelines or <coughs> like scripts for ETLs or something, you can use <coughs> one of the existing tools to, uh, for example, generate reports. Uh, yeah, so the list is quite large here. And let's, let's go back to the companies that are using Presto. So <clears throat> the most famous company is obviously Facebook. So they have really huge clusters of Presto, like 10,000 node plus, and they have like hundreds of concurrent queries at the same time. So they, uh, I think they're, they're the biggest user of Presto internally, <clears throat> like the bigger user of Presto at all. And they have like 300 petabyte of data. So it's, it's astronomical. Uh, other companies that use Presto are Netflix, so they also have a lot of data, like 100 petabytes. What's different about them is that they're running Presto completely within the cloud, uh, and they have something like 300 plus nodes there. <coughs> so Uber also uses Presto, 150 petabytes of data, uh, 160,000 of queries per day, uh, 2,000 nodes plus. Twitter, also 2,000 nodes. Uh, Comcast, um, 100 nodes. 
This is actually, uh, it's, Compass is actually supported by Starburst. Uh, there is Lyft, so they use it for interactive queries, mostly reporting. <coughs> there is Yahoo Japan, 200 nodes plus, also Starburst supported. Uh, FINRA, FINRA is a large US company that does the financial auditing, I think. So they uh, have also 100 plus nodes and they use our support. So if you want to join the community, you can use the, I, I recommend joining the Slack. You can learn a lot of interesting things there. We are all there uh, and we try to answer the questions uh, or uh, troubleshoot the problems. So uh, yeah, I, I really recommend that. Uh, there, the, there is a GitHub, uh, Presto is available on GitHub. Um, you can also, for example, file an issue there if you find something uh, interesting. There is a mailing group also. Uh, yeah, l l I would also like to talk a bit about Starburst. So the company was founded in 2017 uh, and it consisted of uh, uh, about, uh, out, it consisted from committers, the Presto project, which generated about 50% of commits within the Presto SQL. Uh, and uh, we come from, uh, we have, a, we come from various companies, but we have experience if, our, our past companies were Tradata, Hadapt, which was the actually first SQL, first uh, iteration of the SQL on Hadoop engine. Vertica, Netiza. Uh, what we do is that we offer Presto on various platforms and the platform will, list will grow. Uh, so we offer Presto on Kubernetes, uh, on Azure, on AWS, GCP, and so on. And the company is headquartered, headquartered in Boston. Now, uh, what we contributed to Presto or, or give extra is that we have a mission control around Presto. So this the Presto, even, Presto is really scalable and really fits the cloud, but there are some details that are very specific to Presto, so we try to uh, lower the bar barrier of entry for the project. And with mission control, which is the UI over Presto, we try to automate the cluster creation and make it easy. And this will, be, this will continue to grow into the integrated Presto platform. We also added uh, security integrations for LDAP, Ranger, uh, Kerberos, so a lot of enterprise features around security. Uh, we constantly improve the SQL of the Presto, SQL support of the Presto, so this constantly improves. We add, uh, we, we try, we, we add latest features from the latest SQL standard, but we also enhance existing features. For example, for the correlated queries, we support new use cases. Uh, we also provide ODBC and JDBC drivers, and these are certified with Tableau. Uh, yeah. uh, and we, apart from that, there are connectors which are Starbucks specific. So if you, if you want to integrate Oracle, if you want to integrate Snowflake or Teradata, uh, we have connectors for these so that you can have unified view, but you can also offload from some of these databases to Presto, so migrate from, from the stuff. Uh, and we uh, also, uh, the next two things are that we are also constantly improving query performance, so we get the feedback from the users, but we are also doing internal benchmarks, and we are also, there are also um, long-term projects within the Presto that aim at making it even faster. So we constantly work on this. Uh, one, another, for example, of an example of such project was the cost-based optimizer. So it was Starbucks that uh, added that. Uh, and this allowed for the standard, if you, if you run the TPCH, TPCDS benchmarks with the cost-based optimizer, you get like many times, I, I don't recall the number now, but it's like many times the performance of, of running the queries without the cost-based optimizer, which translates to lower cost of ownership. So if you want to try uh, Starbust, you can go to our webpage. You can try, for example, with Kubernetes. So it's with Kubernetes, for example, you, you can do the, you can launch the actual Presto cluster in like five minutes. So this is quite amazing. 
Uh, right, so what I would like to do now is I would like to show you the demo, how the Presto works. Let me switch to the console. So what I have here is I have a pre-existing Kubernetes cluster uh, within the AWS, uh, consisting of um, I don't know, six nodes, R4, ADX large, so quite a beefy ones, uh, and I have a Presto deployed there. So let's see what kind of pod I, I do have. Okay, so as you can see, uh, all Kubernetes uh, integration is based on the Kubernetes operator. So it's really native, kind of to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, co operator monitors the um, Presto resource type and will create a cluster. Uh, if you create a cluster, so let me let me show you that. So for example, with this one, with you can do, so, so Kubernetes operator will monitor resources of type Prestos, and I created such resource and Kubernetes operator uh, spawned a cluster for me. The cluster consists of a coordinator, but also uh, for, uh, um, it also consists of five worker nodes now let's see how the definition of the cluster looks like within the Kubernetes. So, so for example, what you can see here, I don't know if it's, okay, it's, so for example, what you can see here is that uh, I defined a car connector to the Presto SQL instance also within the cloud. But apart from that, I also have a connector deployed to Hive within the cloud. So there is a Hive a Metastore EMR instance. And this EMR instance contains the tables, uh, TPCH, TPCS tables, which are stored on S3. So just those two entries allow me to add connectors for those two very different data sources. Uh, Okay, uh, so what I will now do now is that I will show you um, the, I will run the CLI of Presto and issue some queries there. Okay, let's not do this one. Right, so I'm, so what I did now is I ran the, Presto, I connected to Kubernetes, uh, to the Presto coordinator pod and ran a CLI there. Uh, and what I can do now is that I can do, uh, see let's, what catalogs I have within Presto system. So as you can see, I have a Hive catalog, I have a PostgreSQL uh, catalog, I also have a TPCH catalog, which is for uh, generating TPCH data um, on the fly. Uh, I can show you what I can show. I can this, um, show the schemas from these catalogs, for example. So I can show schemas um, from Hive catalog. Yeah. So as you can see, Hive catalog contains the tables, which we usually use for benchmarking, uh, and it contains that the tables are, for example, TPCH of 100 gigabytes of ORC type, uh, like this one. Uh, let's see what schemas I have in Postgre. So I have an information schema, usual, and a public schema, usual Postgre schemas. Let's see what tables I have uh, in public schemas in public schema in Postgre. Uh, so. Yeah, I have, what I did for the demo is that uh, TPCH data set consists of fact tables, but also from dimensional tables. I copied some dimensional tables to the PostgreSQL 
and I will issue a query uh, that spans across, that will fetch the, uh, that will use the dimensional tables from the PostgreSQL, but also, but also use the fact tables from the Hive connectors. So as you can see, I can combine S3 data with the metadata tables from the classical connectors, and this, also, this, this shows, the power, shows the power of, the, of, of Presto. <coughs> Before I do that, I will uh, forward the Presto coordinator UI locally. Uh, not this one again. <coughs> okay. So. Okay, so I have it. Um, so this is the UI of the Presto. Uh, you see that I have five active running workers. I already issued some queries to Presto. Uh, let me now run the query. So this is one of the TPCH queries that are used for benchmarking. As you can see here, I use tables from the fact tables from the, from the TPCH, uh, from the Hive connector, but use the dimensional tables from the PostgreSQL connector. So let's run the query. Let's issue the query, and uh, you will see now. Let's go with this. Uh, boo -boo -boo. Ah, here it is. So, yeah, it, it actually finished in 10 seconds. But you can see uh, that it was running for a while, and it produced. Uh, so it, we can go to the query details, for example. We can see. Uh, let's see if it produced a result. It did. So here is the result, and here, here are details about the execution, how it, how it was scheduled, how many stages it had. Uh, this is also the status uh, of the task on the workers. So again, it's important to know that Presto is, is running the, its own execution engine. It doesn't, uh, it's, it's not just a li li semantic overlay over the existing databases, it just runs the computations in a distributed way. Okay, that's, that's everything I had. Let me go back to the presentation. So, uh, right, so. So thank you uh, again, and now uh, we will talk about operator more. Thanks, Carl. All right, so one of the things that I do at Red Hat is that I work with our partners who are also working with open source to help them, <laughs> to help them bring their technology onto Kubernetes and onto OpenShift. And so let's talk a little bit about operators and you know, how we did this. Uh, how many people in here are familiar with Kubernetes operators? or the operator pattern, I should say. All right, so I'll go pretty quick through this since probably most of you already know this, and when I get details wrong, you can just shout at me and let me know how wrong I have it, okay? So in general, and you know, this is kind of how we use Kubernetes, right? Like user comes up, says something like, I want a pod, Kubernetes goes and does a bunch of stuff and returns a pod to them, you know, in some manner or fashion. And this, little circle here is kind of indicating somewhere inside there's kind of a loop watching for these things happening, updating events as they come in. And internally there's these mechanisms, you know, etcd is like this storage that we use for all the different, you know, objects that come into the system, and that's continually talking to internal machinery inside Kubernetes, which again is looking for all these different types of objects. So we mentioned a pod before, but what I tried to do here was grab like a to Z of all the different objects in Kubernetes. So from API service to volume attachment, the internal mechanisms are watching for updates here, 
sending the updated information to CD, returning it back to the user, deploying containers, or attaching volumes, or creating API services, whatever that happens to be. So the question comes in, how do we extend Kubernetes? Because one of the things that happened very early in Kubernetes was that people said, well, you know, pod is great, but what I'd like is a presto. And what does that even mean? Well, it, it's a little bit much for the Kubernetes maintainers to add special objects for everything, and it, would, it wouldn't scale well for the project as an open source project to just let everyone add their stuff in. So this operator pattern started to emerge. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, our, our friends at CoreOS really pioneered a lot of this and, and showed us how to create this pattern. And in the beginning, there was you know, talking between controllers and operators. These were different types of mechanisms internally. But the idea was we needed a way to be able to customize these things. So how can I capture this inside of Kubernetes, right? I want to know one Presto might be a Presto controller, it might be a Hive Metastore, a Postgres SQL database to store information. How do I encapsulate this all together? Custom resource definitions. These used to be known as extensions inside Kubernetes, and these give us a way to start defining the data or defining the objects that make up, you know, one Presto, for example. Now, the back end of this is there's now an operator kind of looking for these things. Those loops are now looking for this special type of resource that I've made. I'm just going to highlight a few sections here on this. So we can see at the top, this is the type of thing that I'm creating inside of Kubernetes. I'm telling Kubernetes, please make a custom resource definition for me. And it knows how to watch for these things. And in this case, I'm telling it, what do I want to call that? I want to call it a presto. And what would I call a list of them? And what would I call it in plural? And, and these things help with the command line tooling that you have and, and how you interact with these things. And then lastly, you can see down here, I can give like a version to what I'm creating. And the point is that when I create this resource definition, now Kubernetes knows what a presto is. It's not necessarily watching to do anything with it at this point, but it knows what it is. Now, if I would like to make a presto, I need to issue a custom resource manifest to Kubernetes. And this gets pushed in, and this is, you know, this is how we actually deploy a presto. So again, you can see the type here. This is what we put in the resource definition. And you can see the version number after it. And then the rest of the information here is really specific to Presto. It's telling how, how does Presto get configured, you know, et cetera. And at this point, you know, Kubernetes doesn't really do anything with this because it doesn't really have any sort of watcher that's looking for a Presto type. So the Presto operator is now going to can watch for these resources as they come in, and then it can start to do whatever it needs to do to deploy the workers, to deploy the Hive Metastore, et cetera. So getting started building operators has kind of been a long time coming in the community. And what I wanted to do here was share some resources and talk about some of the ways that you could get started writing your own operator. Um, one of the biggest places I think to go is the operator SDK. Um, this is at GitHub uh, in the operator framework. Um, I guess, group, and there's lots of different projects in there, and you can write these operators in Go, Ansible, or Helm, and then what they have is a, a tooling that will create a framework for you, so you really have all the pieces necessary to attach to Kubernetes, to put your custom resource definition in, and then to watch for when those resources come in. So you'll have you know, a code point that you can just start putting in your own custom things. Another option is KubeBuilder. Uh, this is popular in the upstream Kubernetes community. And um, I, I personally have not used it very deeply, so I don't know a lot about it. But you know, I, I, from what I've heard is it's another way to create these things. Um, another one that I'm familiar with, if you're into more JVM-based languages, is the, uh, the, ab the JVM Abstract Operator, um, the author of which, uh, Jurka Kremser over here, um, has kindly put into GitHub. And we've seen, like, many different JVM language operators come out of that. So you could write it in Java, you could write it in Scala. Um, the list is, is pretty large. Anything that you can compile in a JVM, you could make work with this. And lastly, if you're, if you're really excited about this and you just love to hack on Kubernetes, you could roll your own. Um, and there's a whole list of client libraries for many different languages. And what you'll learn about during that process is 
How do I register my custom resource definition? definition? How do I create a watch that looks for updates to that definition? You know, you'll see how these things happen, but you also won't be taking advantage of the engineering that's gone into these other projects, so you'll have to do all of your own you know, security testing and you know, find your own bugs and all that exciting stuff that we love about software development. So the next part is, okay, I've created a, an operator. How do I get it into Kubernetes? How do I let Kubernetes know that my operator is looking for a certain type of resource? Well, one thing you could do is just manually insert it. These operators run in containers. They run in containers in Kubernetes. And depending on your Kubernetes, they might need a little special permission to be able to you know, inject custom resource definitions. But when I'm testing these things, I run them on my laptop and just connect them to a remote cluster. Well, that's not going to scale very well in production. So there's a project called the Operator Lifecycle Manager. And this is another operator of its own that can help you to, to package your operators to get them injected into Kubernetes. And it's got a whole life cycle around keeping your, your operator up and running. And it'll, you can encode the dependencies that your operator needs. Um, it, there's a way to discover operators in the OLM. So if users are looking for a Presto, they can search the operator hub for, for a Presto and then, hey, there's an operator for this. Um, you can also get automatic updates by subscribing to channels through the OLM, and then it will upgrade your operators on your cluster. And uh, if you want to know more, I'd say go to operatorhub.io. There's tons of operators there, community operators, and you can just kind of explore. Now, what I'm going to show you here is, um, so the Kubernetes that I use most frequently is OpenShift. Um, and what we're looking at here is just a, a screenshot I took of, of the OpenShift container platform. But if you are an administrator, you can see over on the, the left-hand side, I've got this operator hub open. And these operators are ready to be deployed directly from the console. So I could just log in. I could say, all right, you can see there's a big data uh, section there. I go to big data, look for Presto. I click install it. And now I'm ready to start deploying Prestos on my Kubernetes cluster, right? So I can start playing with this technology you know, right away. So the next part of this is like you've created your operator, you've got the OLM managing it, you understand you know, how it works, you've fixed all the bugs. How do we publish this? How do I get my operator into the operator hub so that people can search for it and then be installing Prestos in no time, right? So you know, a couple different questions. You, know, you first have to ask yourself, are you going to make an open source or a closed source driver or a closed source operator? You know, how will you manage those things? I won't get too much into that. I mean, obviously, I'm going to advocate for an open source driver. But you, the point here is that if you are in an organization where you are creating closed source code or you're not able to share your code, there is not a requirement that your operator be open source. You could create a closed source operator and run that. Um, the other thing you'll want to do is start automating your image builds. So as you, every time you update your operator, every time you're testing, you know, you are doing testing, right? Every time your testing passes, you're creating new images and automatically uploading them. Again, continuous testing. This is where things get difficult, you know, because you can imagine for something like Presto, you saw that it deployed a lot of pods with it, and there was a lot going on there, right? So sometimes testing can be really difficult in this uh, respect because you could do unit testing just for the small pieces. You know, if I ask for a Presto, does it actually make the pods that I think it should? But then the next part is, how do I test to make sure that the Presto it deployed works? That's very specific to your organization and to the code that you're creating because you might need to, you might need to have data to query. You have to have something that injects the queries. You know, so you can see this is where things get complicated. But then the last part is, you can upload your operator information to the operator hub. And this is where the tool, this is why I kind of led with operator SDK, because the tooling in operator SDK will create the files necessary for you to make it really easy just to upload those. And you have a definition file that's this uh, cluster service version that will describe you know, what your operator is, where the image comes from, you know, some bits and pieces of how you could search for it. I think maybe you can encode like an image in there too, like so it shows the icon for your project. Now, just to talk a little bit about the tooling that we use, um, 
when you're testing an operator, you may not necessarily want to deploy your own you know, Kubernetes to AWS or something like that. So I just wanted to highlight some of these tools because these are things that you could run on a, by today's standards, modest laptop, uh, 16 gigs depending on you know, RAM, depending on how complex your, your deployments are. You could run these on, on your laptop. So there's Minikube, which is you know, very popular. It uses virtual machines to spawn up Kubernetes on your machine. Um, there's another project called Kind, which is Kubernetes in Docker. So you can use, if you just have Docker on your machine, you can use Kind to deploy Kubernetes as containers. And then, you know, you can interact with Kubernetes that way. Excuse me. And then the last one uh, that I'm highlighting here is Code Ready Containers. And this is a project from, in my mind, just some absolutely brilliant engineers who have taken uh, all the tooling that goes with OpenShift and, and put it together as, a, as an installer that can create uh, an OpenShift instance on your laptop. And o OpenShift is a little different in some ways from Kubernetes in that it, um, it has a lot more like health and auto scaling kind of built into it. So the, it needs a little more robust deployment you know, to really get the most out of it. And, this, and Code Running Containers has been a wonderful way for me to kind of interact with that. So if you're really curious about Kubernetes operators and you want to learn more, like this little, uh, this, this little appetizer was not enough, there's actually a workshop in a couple hours. Um, go learn how to make an operator. They'll get you up and running, and you can really you know, get into it and figure out how to do this. I'll, I'll leave this up for a second. These are really a bunch of useful links. The first one is kind of the core S. Uh, discussion of operators and kind of the philosophy behind the operator pattern and you know there there isn't like an API necessarily for operators but you know you you can learn about how they work um, the next one is the operator the operator framework and the operator SDK you know this is where you go to get all that tooling uh, the kube builder book operator hub uh, the JVM operators and uh, lastly uh, some client libraries so um, Carol, I think, like, uh, join me again, or Carl, sorry. Um, so the, the point here is that Starburst and Red Hat are both hiring. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe I would like to, like, if you would like to work on exciting project, we have a lot of opportunities. So we are building, uh, we will be building platform, a modern platform based on Kubernetes. The, for the SaaS, we are also have positions for for the Presto project itself. Um, yeah, so we really have top people um, in the company, and uh, we have offices in Warsaw. We have offices. Uh, we have office in Boston. We have also office in California. So yeah, so we are hiring and. If you want, I recommend. Yeah. One, one more thing is that we recently got, I think, one of the biggest A round uh, ever. Uh, so for the for the big data company. So yeah. So <laughs> if that might be also a recommendation, I think it's 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 worth to mention. So yeah, and with that, uh, we say thank you, and uh, I guess we have some time for questions. Any questions? So the question is, can Presto be used as a way to migrate from Oracle to other databases? And you know what? I think Carl knows the answer to that. Uh, from Oracle to Presto or from Oracle to something else? Yeah, I mean, as long as, as there are connectors, you can migrate your data from Oracle to something else. And uh, you can also uh, have a consistent view during the process, for example, right? So we can have some tables here, some tables there. Uh, we've seen cases, uh, <coughs> actually, for the, <coughs> for the big data, um, data for, for big data, where, where big data data databases 
uh, are being migrated from. So, for example, we've seen customers migrating from Tradata, for example. They want to offload their data from Tradata to Presto. Uh, yeah, so this is one of the patterns that we observe. Uh, yeah, so the question was, what is the difference between, between Starburst distribution and uh, open source distribution? So uh, I, think, I think some of the key aspects are that we provide this ranger and security extensions, which are enterprise components, and um, those are often enablers for the customers to use Presto at all. Another thing is that... So, with Ranger, for example, we can be a drop-in replacement for existing Hive. Hive also uses Ranger, but if you, if you use Ranger with Presto and Hive Connector, then you can enforce the same security policies. Apart from that, we give you the Qality connectors, so uh, like Oracle connector. Uh, there are also connectors for the other databases like Teradata, like Snowflake. Um, this is another aspect. Another thing is that we um, we also have uh, some performance improvements. So for a long time, CBO was um, on, only within like it was first in our Starburst release, and then only it landed in Presto SQL open source. And uh, we also give you the vehicles to deploy Presto, right? So you can deploy Presto using Kubernetes, but you can also deploy Presto on AWS with the um, cloud, watch, uh, cloud formation templates. So we also give you this uh, seamless experience, and this will continue to be more important as we go forward. So we will um, make more around Presto so that like, you won't need to set up Ranger yourself, but for example, we will have policy engine ourselves integrated, so that's even more, that's, this lowers the barrier even more for, uh, for customers. Uh, and another thing is that we provide the support for you, and this is often very important to have a supported solution. So yeah, the, que the question is, in the context of the operator on Kubernetes, what is actually doing the work to spawn and scale out? Is it the operator or is it actually Presto? So, so it's kind of mixed because if you scale down, for example, you don't want to terminate the existing queries. So we have an integration with Presto itself. So we do kind of graceful scale down. And uh, this integration, like another aspect is that we do auto configuration within Presto. So when the pod is started, we try to set up properties of the Presto so that it matches the pod capacity, like memory or CPUs. Uh, yeah, and operator also translates uh, like the spec properties from the operator to the Presto kind of properties. So it provides a nice front end over Presto. Uh, I expect that there will be even more tighter integration in the future between Presto and Operator, so that we are planning to support things like blue-green de blue deployments or auto-scaling, and then there will be a part that Presto would need to be adjusted or extended for the custom scheduler uh, or custom auto-scaler that would trigger some actions around that, like tell if I need some more nodes or not, Maybe 
maybe there will be some required um, things around um, the query dispatching if you have multiple clusters, right? So this will be more tightly coupled in the future. Thank you.